Hello everyone, welcome to our first webinar. I'm Sangeeta Vasani. I'm a family support practitioner at Brent Specialist Academy Trust. Today's webinar focus will be on communication and interaction. Joining us is Ellie Cornford. And Ellie, <laughs> Ellie will be answering questions on communication and interaction brought forward by parents. Um, before we start, I just want to make you aware of a few points. All participants, audio and video will be muted and hidden. You will only see and hear Ellie and me. This webinar will be recorded, but be assured only Ellie and I will be visible and audible. Your names will not be displayed. Direct chat visible only to Ellie and I might be enabled at the end of the meeting for further questions if we have any time. So, shall we get started? Let's do that. <laughs> so, our first question is, my child doesn't speak, so I don't know what they want. Okay, so it's a common question that we get asked as speech and language therapists. And children tend to show us in other ways what it is that they want or need. So, if we observe them carefully, we can spot patterns in the way that they might look at us, uh, go to things they want, pull us around, look at the things they want, maybe make a noise or change their facial expression and so on. And it's these moments when a child is really motivated by something that they can't access or achieve on their own that are the most powerful teaching moments for showing them a way of asking for the thing that they want. Um, and obviously some children can copy spoken words and then that's how they learn to say them independently. Uh, and other children can't copy what their communication partners say, but instead they could potentially learn to copy a different mode of communicating. So uh, it might be a Makaton sign or it might be a symbol based system of some form. So some children learn to point to symbols on a communication board. Some children learn to give a symbol as part of the picture exchange communication system. So really thinking a little bit about AAC or alternative and augmentative communication um, making sure that children have a way of communicating even if it's not vocal to begin with. Yeah that sounds good. Um, I guess um, for parents um, this situation would be even harder if the child is upset or distressed and again you were talking about just seeing their body language and their expression just to kind of gauge what could be wrong with the child and then use that opportunity at that in that moment to try and teach some kind of AAC or communication. Um, Absolutely because when a child's distressed and you don't know why that's that's really difficult it's horrible you feel like you can't really help them and it's important to acknowledge that we all tend to lose a little bit of our capacity to communicate when for some reason whatever reason we're not feeling great maybe we're tired or upset feeling a bit stressed maybe not very well and um, so sometimes it's important for us to reduce our expectations at that point and mm -hmm. and maybe at, at the same time increase the level of support we're providing so if a child's usually able to tell us something in one way uh, mm -hmm. like it might be a vocal child then they might benefit from having some symbols available mm -hmm. when they need help with repairing and communication breakdown so if something's upset them or annoyed them uh, or if they're not really calm enough to communicate as they usually would and similarly if they're already a symbol user then they might need a simpler board or something like that to to have fewer options when they need to just communicate i either want this thing or this thing to make me feel better so again thinking yeah about aac some signs or symbols can could help with this and when children are upset it's generally best to try and avoid if you can talking about something that's upset or annoyed them while they're still in that heightened state of distress they might need our support to calm down first and regulate and sometimes we just need to think about showing the child some ways that they could do that it, it's different for every child it could be modeling slow deep breaths or some children respond well to being shown something they can do with their hands or something with their jaw to help get that kind of calming organizing feedback so your ot your occupational therapist can really help with this they might be able to suggest some strategies or some activities that could help 
and the the reason why that's also really good is that it can mean that it sort of helps you avoid just offering the child loads of different things that they usually like when they're upset because you really want them to calm down it might be tempting but we have to be careful that we're not just teaching the child that should they wish to be offered all kinds of their favorite things all they have to do is start crying or shouting and then they'll get that sort of big menu of things will appear so maybe helping them to calm down first and then thinking about what do they want what was the problem uh, and it, and the communication will be better enabled because they'll be calmer but then I think also if the child's distressed or upset because they don't know how to show you what they want or because you're not understanding them in some way it'll be really important to maybe figure out through trial and error what they do want and then if possible show them a more appropriate way of asking for it Okay, brilliant. Thank you. So our next question is, my child refuses to use the communication board and hides it in the cupboard. Okay. <laughs> so um, it's really great to have communication boards at home as a mode of, of AAC. So we're well done for starting that and for, for persevering with that. Um, it's really important that any mode of AAC is paired with a uh, positive experiences where initially the demands should be really really low and reinforcement should be really high because we need the child to really realize the value of that uh, system that we've given them and understand why using it is going to be more valuable for them than not using it in the long run um, so in that particular case where a child's showing quite clearly that at the moment they're not particularly interested in using that communication board and they're they're hiding it away we may need to really take a good few steps back and reduce the expectations maybe begin by just having the board just in the room same room as the child some of the time and then look for opportunities when they're really happily engaged in the motivating activity that you can gradually bring that board closer into them try to engage with them on their own agenda and reinforce them just for tolerating the board being in the room or on the table or on the floor next to them in that activity um, and then as they get better at tolerating that, then you can gradually start to begin to model using the board again, because that's really the way that we, we teach the use of, of these systems, especially a communication board, is just through modelling. And sometimes it can take months of modelling with no expectation on the child to, to copy before they start to use it. But they are learning all that time. They're learning from watching. And if they do begin to look at or use the board, we need to remember always to try and honour any attempts that they do make to communicate as quickly as possible so that that board becomes paired with those positive experiences of getting the things that I want, having mum or dad's attention, being involved in an activity that I really like. Um, I think some people also sometimes worry that if they use AAC with their child, so signing or symbols, that it might mean their child won't begin to talk. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a really common question that we get asked. It's it's a really uh, it's a really valid concern, um, but it's also something that the research says we really shouldn't worry about. Like if anything, the opposite is true. That giving someone a, a, an effective and functional mode of communication can actually mean that that they're able to um, get their needs and wants uh, communicated and known, uh, and they're experiencing language they're developing their language and in some cases children do develop speech after they've been using a different system an AAC system um, and some don't but they get very proficient at using their AAC so they have that functional way of communicating which makes such a difference for their independence their way of quality of life yeah that sounds really good so I guess the key message is just to be patient and keep the sort of you know don't put too much pressure on them and just make it available in, in the fun times absolutely yeah and show how it could be show how it can be used with with those low expectations I and mean, if you think about how babies learn to speak they don't do anything like what we're doing for a really long time and so it's the same when we're showing someone how to use a different system okay great thank you so next we've got my child communicates with some family members but not others my child talks to him but not to other people okay 
so I'll talk about those two separately, although they are kind of similar and linked. So obviously it's understandably frustrating if you know that your child can say some words or you know that they can communicate well in, a, in an alternative way, but only in some situations and then they don't do it in other situations. I think the key here is that generalisation is a really important part of that learning process, especially for children with autism. Because typically children tend to be able to learn something in one set setting and then apply it in lots of other situations without having to relearn. And that's what we call generalising the skill. But children with autism often struggle more to do that. And they do need to be taught specifically how to transfer their skills from one environment or one person mm -hmm. to another. So in the case where like one or some family members may be having more success than others in communicating with the child, it might be important to see what strategies that those people are using to support the child to communicate. Maybe they ask fewer questions so the child feels less pressure. Uh, perhaps they find it a little bit easier to spot what the child's interested in and then follow their lead. Uh, generally speaking, as you've already said, Sangeeta, we do obviously always advise against trying to force a child to communicate because we really want to avoid making communication like a negative and aversive experience that can be really traumatic and can obviously have the opposite effect to what we want. Mm -hmm. So your child speech and language therapist can always advise you on general strategies to support communication and then you could look at talking to your wider network of family and friends about what you found that has worked and whether they could maybe try some of those same strategies as well. Um, with children who uh, say things on their own agenda talking to themselves but they don't talk um, in situations with other people, uh, that's, it, it can it can be quite confusing because it seems like they can talk but they don't do it with intention to communicate with us and in those mm -hmm. situations I normally try and encourage people to think about the means reasons and opportunities model for communication so if a child isn't communicating effectively it's often because there are going to be some barriers in one of those three areas so we need to make sure they have a means of communicating that works for them so again if they're not vocal it could be a form of AAC across a range of different functions of language and then they also need lots of varied opportunities to practice that so in the case of that child who's vocalizing to themselves it's probably a reasons barrier that we need to look at for why they might uh, not be communicating at some other times and some children really present as not being very highly motivated to communicate with others so it's up to us then as communication partners to find ways to to build that motivation so if you find yourself in that situation where a child is maybe labeling things to themselves when they're contained within their own play but they're not asking for anything or commenting or greeting in other situations i would definitely advise to contact your speech and language therapist because they'll be able to uh, advise you on how you could work out maybe what what the exact problem is and and try to solve it with you um, and I'll just plug our email address if that's okay while we're here because uh, you can always email the SALT team. It's just salt at manor.brent.sch.uk and that's for all BSAT parents. So um, just because it has manor in the title doesn't mean it's not for the Avenue children as well. So please, please do email us if you, okay. if you have any of these specific problems or if you want more information on anything that we're talking about. Brilliant. Great. So. Moving on, um, our next question is, my child has just started to say a couple of words. How can I make them say more? That's great. That's such an exciting time when a child first starts speaking or maybe they use a sign or point to a symbol for the first time. And as we said before, it's really important to remember that it does take a long time to learn how to communicate. We know ba babies experience people communicating with and around them for a lot of months before we'd expect them to start speaking. And if a child's development's delayed, they might start speaking later, but they also might progress more slowly once they do start speaking. So it's really important to celebrate every tiny step of progress that they make because we have to acknowledge that what they're learning to do is, is something that's actually quite hard. Um, so my advice would be, continue to model lots of words and phrases relevant to the situation um, and always try and follow exactly where the child's interest or attention is in that moment so that you're labeling the thing that they're looking at they're more likely to associate that new word that they hear with the thing that's ca captured their attention at that time 
Um, but again, try not to demand that they copy you. So just labeling or commenting on things is, is really valuable and just model using language for lots of different functions. So you might be greeting, you might be asking a question, you might just be commenting for information, you might be trying to draw someone's attention to something. So we don't want our children just to learn how to request, we want them to have that varied use of language. And if they do say something or communicate using a symbol or a sign, then when you model back, you can add an extra word to show them how they can maybe expand that, uh, what they've said. But again, with no expectation on them to copy, just showing them how they could say a slightly longer phrase next time or, or add a new word. Um, again, it's really important to think about reinforcement as well, because we are trying to teach a new skill here. So reinforce any attempts to communicate, and that could look like giving them your attention, praising them, uh, joining in with what they're doing, looking what they're looking at, um, giving them something they've asked for or something you know that they like anyway. Um, there's lots of different ways that we can reinforce those attempts to communicate. And we can also use differential reinforcement to encourage even more progress. So that basically means that we give more reinforcement for a better attempt to communicate. So for example, if a child's just learned to say apple and they sometimes say apple when they want apple, you could try giving them a larger piece and lots of praise if they say it and it's nice and clear. But if they sort of just go back to pointing to it and making kind of ah noise, then just give them a little bit. So they start to realize that the better attempts get more of the thing that they wanted and um, if it's not something that you can break into pieces then it could be that they get a more exaggerated response for you, from you or they get more time playing with something that they've asked for before you set reset yeah, yeah. you talking about is making me miss all the children <laughs> just our lovely no i know <laughs> <laughs> so the next question is, my child is talking a lot about coronavirus because they're feeling scared. Okay, yeah, it's that's so tricky. Like, it's just such an unusual time at the moment for literally everyone. And many, many people will be struggling with the situation, different aspects of the situation that are difficult for them, meaning that many of us are feeling scared and stressed um, and worried. And, and that's understandable. And I think it's important to remember that children can often pick up on a lot of what is going on around them, even if they don't fully understand all the words they hear or they haven't fully grasped the implications of what's going on. They are really porous to that anxiety that they might feel coming from others. Um, and it, obviously that can make them feel scared too. And it's, it's probably impossible to avoid it completely, but it is worth being aware of how often a child might be being exposed to maybe scary sounding news in the media or just overhearing conversations between adults. Um, having said that, it is important to engage with children on these difficult topics at an appropriate level. If they're showing us by keeping on saying, oh, coronavirus, coronavirus, then they're showing us that they do want to talk about it and we need to sort of find a facilitative way of doing that. In, in some cases, over the past few months, we've really tried to simplify the situation for our children to help them understand. But in a way, I sometimes wonder whether we're actually making things a bit more difficult for them and for us as the circumstances then begin to change. So for example, at the start of lockdown, in order to help them understand why they're not going to school, we might have really drummed into our children, you know, we can't go outside, it's not safe, it's not safe. And now the restrictions are starting to lift and we might start to feel a bit more confident to maybe go outside again in certain situations, but there's not really any concrete frame of reference for the child to understand why is it safe now, but it wasn't before? Why wasn't it safe before? Why doesn't it look any different? So I think that's that's really confusing uh, for the child. And, and it's almost like we've told them it's not safe and now we have to backtrack and be like, okay, it is safe now. But again, do we even know that ourselves? So there's there's so much at play here. And over the last few months, the speech and language therapy team have been writing a lot of social stories to, to help our pupils try to understand different aspects of the various situations that families have found themselves in and asked for help with. So some children couldn't understand why they had to stay in. Some were uh, happy to stay in themselves, but then they got worried about their parents going out. Uh, some were scared to go out at all. 
Uh, some were sadly grieving family members or friends and many of them obviously didn't understand why they couldn't go to school and see their friends and see their teachers. Some of them got a bit too used to having a bit of extra time on the phone or the iPad and really didn't want to give that up. So there's been all sorts of things that we've we've had to address. And social stories is a way of using symbols with, with text. And uh, for a child who can read, sometimes we, we don't need the symbols, but mostly we do. And we can use those to really clearly explain a situation and help someone understand why things might be how they are, what you can do in that situation. We always try to keep them really accurate and true. We want them to be as true as possible so the child can develop their trust in the message that's coming from that story. But obviously they also need to be as simple as is needed for that child's particular level of understanding. And they can be really helpful for um, supporting a child to internalize the important messages that we're trying to give them about a situation. That can be quite reassuring and supportive. If it's repeated a lot, they start to internalize that language. And then in the heat of the moment, you can then use that familiar language again, and that can be uh, reassuring. So again, if you feel like you're in a situation that's really difficult to explain, do consult with a child speech and language therapist because we'll happily uh, talk to you about the situation, figure out the exact nature of the problem and then try and produce a story that you can read with your child to help them understand. Yeah, that's great. Um, I guess, like you said, because it's changing all the time, um, you can um, you can use these social stories for to explain the change as well. Sometimes Absolutely. I yeah, you can you can acknowledge earlier we said this now this has changed and now we're saying this and you know i've i've had on my list that you know when when more children are coming back to school we're going to have to start thinking about well okay we sent home this big social story that explained why we can't come to school and and that you know it wasn't safe to go out and there was this virus and we're going to have to backtrack from that and explain mm -hmm. like this is what we've done to make school safe uh, we've already sent home stories like that for the children who are currently attending one of our provisions um, and and we're going to have to do that for everyone and that that is something that we'll definitely pro be providing for all families to make sure that they've got something to support them to start saying yeah I know you haven't been at school for a really long time but when you go back some things are going to be different potentially we don't know what yet we don't know when but it will still be an effective way of hopefully supporting the children to feel a bit a bit better about that. Yeah. And cool. um, next we have, I give my child instructions, but they can't or won't follow it. What can I do to help? Okay. So we've talked a lot about expressive communication, but this is sort of tapping more into understanding and receptive communication. Um, so often we need to show children what we mean when we give them an instruction or um, teach them, help them how to respond in an appropriate way to instructions. Uh, often it helps to model or guide them to do the required action. If it's like a sequence of actions that they need to do, then we could make it easier to start with by helping with most of the sequence and then letting them finish it off on their own. And then we can gradually fade back our prompts so that they do more and more of the task independently and learn what, what it means when you say that specific instruction. It's important to remember that receptive communication can also be affected by the same factors that we talked about earlier. So feeling tired, being upset or angry, feeling poorly, being a bit dysregulated. So you might find that sometimes um, a child appears to understand, but not always. Uh, they also might be picking up cues from the situation or looking at what other people are doing, which can mask difficulties in pure understanding. So then when those cues aren't there anymore, they can't follow the instruction because actually the only reason they understood it before was because they were copying someone else or it was the only obvious thing to do in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, so if you find that's happening, again, your assault can help you to figure out exactly what's going on. However, it could also be that they do know what the instruction is and they know how to follow it but they're just not doing it for another reason we need to figure out what other factors are at play and again we might spot some patterns maybe there's too much distraction in the environment maybe um they only do what they only don't do what what's been asked of them in certain situations so they might be fine at putting most toys away but not 
the most preferred ones or the iPad or when we interrupt their favorite play, it might look like suddenly they don't understand the instruction to tidy up anymore. Um, or maybe it's the case that actually when they don't follow the instruction, they get lots and lots of attention because they get help to do it and they get a bit more kind of interaction at that point. Um, so that's really thinking about whether they're getting enough reinforcement when they do follow the instruction to make sure that they're going to uh, continue to do that. Um, if you do find yourself often in a situation where your child's not, not uh, following instructions, I'd certainly recommend come along to our webinar on behaviour, which is not next week, but the week after on the 10th of July at 10.30. I'm sure Emily will be talking more about this kind of difficulty in that session. And um, would you practice maybe like giving instructions in like a play situation in a fun activity just so that you can practice giving that praise when they have followed an instruction within a game? Absolutely. I mean, developing the vocabulary understanding that you're then going to use in the in the situation where the instruction is key is yeah. so important. If they don't know what the words mean, then they're not going to be able to follow the instruction. So um, certainly setting up opportunities to practice things and, and practicing routines and stuff is really, really valuable as well. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Just before you ask the next question, I'll just let everyone know, I'm going to um, enable the chat. So if you want to send a message, I'll be able to see it. So if you do have any questions uh, that you maybe didn't submit in advance or something about anything that we've said so far, um, you can use the chat function to type a message to me. And um, if we have any time at the end, we'll go through and see what's, what's cropped up. Okay, great. So the next question is, my child doesn't ask for things, but just takes the things he or she wants because he or she knows where they are. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, this really comes back to what we were talking about before with that means, reasons and opportunities model for thinking about communication. So if a child can really easily access everything that they want, then it sort of makes sense that they wouldn't always bother to ask for it, especially if asking for things is effortful for them, if it's, if it's hard for them. So perhaps there are some small changes that you could make to the way that things are laid out or stored in, in the house so that the child can still see what's available. We don't want things to necessarily be totally hidden. That can make it harder for them to know what they want and how to ask for it. But maybe thinking about not having everything always being freely accessible. Um, obviously, this has to fit into your daily lives at home. And I understand the pressures of that. So maybe thinking about even the smallest of tweaks that could potentially give your child what just one more reason to communicate or just increase the number of opportunities that they get to practice just a little bit. You don't have to change everything in your entire in your entire home. But just thinking a little bit about is there anything you can do to increase those opportunities in, in that model yeah so could they could they do things like have clear boxes so that the child can still see the item yeah absolutely like if it's in a clear box you can still see it but the box could be out of reach or the box could have a lid that they can't open on their own uh, if you don't have clear boxes, you could also label other boxes so that they can see, oh, this is the thing that's in there, but I can't go into it. You can have some tricky lids or something. Okay, great. We call it sabotage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure that it's not immediately available to them and then they have to figure out another way. That, you know, if the motivation is really high, again, it's that this is the precious teaching moment when they've got the motivation to do it. And instead of just going to access it themselves, we can teach them to do something which might seem a bit harder for them. So it's understandable why they would want to go and get it for themselves. But if the motivation is high enough, then it's a perfect moment to teach. Yeah. So the next question is, my child doesn't understand when something is broken or out of battery. Oh, well, that's fair enough, isn't it? It's so annoying when something you really like stops working. <laughs> um, it's important to remember that we all feel a bit frustrated with that kind of thing sometimes, even if we do understand what the problem is. It's like that thing of when the power goes off and all you want is a cup of tea. Uh, so <laughs> it'll be important to support the child to learn about what's happened as much as possible. So. If something's broken, try to show them 
what's happened rather than just taking it away if something's finished uh, mm -hmm. show them their empty bowl and um, with some children you might be able to you know give a simple explanation of why something can't be fixed or why it has to be thrown away so you know if something's literally like a shard of plastic you can show them well this is this is dangerous now so we can't play with it and just give a bit more background rather than things just sort of really disappearing from uh, their environment that they used to really like um, but with others they might not be able to access that that explanation or understand that so it may be more a case of trying to support them to choose an alternative activity and really really help them to engage and then reinforce them because they're actually tolerating that disappointment at that point um, mm -hmm. which is which is really difficult we all know what that feels like to not have the things that you really wanted um, and if you manage to sort of adjust and play with something else then then that's really good um, if it's a battery issue uh, uh, with a device, um, I'd certainly recommend showing your child the process of charging and, and explain that. Again, I, we've already got a social story that we can send you that's mm -hmm. about um, waiting for things to charge. Um, lots of children just decide, actually, I want it now and I'll take it back, even though it's only got 5% battery. So eventually it would be really nice to even try and teach a child how to charge something themselves. But obviously, you have to consider health and safety and the risks of the, the electricity and everything but um it would be at least really valuable to teach a child how they could ask you to charge it so you could have you could have a little symbol next to the charger or next to the plug so that they can go over and show you that this is about to run out of battery and please can you charge it for me um as i said social stories can be really useful in this case as well because you could use that to explain to the child uh, that you do have to wait while the device charges um no one can use it if it's not got any battery um, and then when the time comes again you just repeat that same familiar language to remind them of what's happening um, it will be important also to make sure that child has some alternative available while they're waiting and that they have a way of accessing that or asking for that most of us uh, really struggle to do absolutely nothing when we wait. You walk past a bus stop, you'll see most people on adults are on their phones or reading or some listening to music because just waiting and doing nothing is really boring. So if you do have to wait for a device to charge, it's good to think about what are you going to do in the meantime and and does your child need help with that? Yeah, yeah, it is nice to have an alternative um, or, or or a choice of two things that you know they can just you know like have a box of motivating toys that you know you can do a swap with as well that that would be great as well yeah uh, definitely so we've come to our last question <laughs> um it is my child doesn't understand work activities when i try to explain them okay yep that's a tricky one as well. I mean, firstly, can I just say how impressed I am with all parents, family members out there who I know have just been working so hard to try and keep their children making progress while they've not been able to go to school. There are just so many challenges that families have uh, faced and it's amazing that people are still sort of really trying to do those work activities. Um, I think especially when you consider children are so used to doing whatever they normally would have done at home and the routines and expectations that we have at school and that they're used to at school might really be very different. So it's just a huge adjustment that they've had to make to kind of transfer their learning time to home instead. Um, it's important that we bear in mind what we said earlier as well about generalisation. So it can be really difficult to apply skills developed in one environment to another environment. And then if you think about it at school, we have loads of staff, we're all trained. There's so many of us were there to support each other and step in when things are difficult uh, and support the children. So there are also a lot of tried and tested strategies that we use at school to help children access and engage in different learning activities so it might be about having some visual support so that the children understand we're going to do this for a while and then we're going to move on to some, doing something else that you really really like so that's um that's a sort of a a now next kind of visual that we can that we can use um, and there are lots of other strategies that we use as well often i think um 
just receiving a sort of a letter or an email with uh, ideas for activities that you can do it gives you the ideas but it doesn't necessarily tell you all the kind of little things that we do to make the activity more appealing or um, to support the child's engagement and obviously it's it's quite difficult for us to know how long the child's going to engage or how many activities we can suggest or um or that kind of thing so it's something that the the parents and carers family members are having to kind of really take on that role of that kind of constant assessment of how if, how is this activity going does it need to be adapted is there anything else I can do and that's something that is, is really really tricky to do um, and it's tiring and takes a lot of energy and concentration and creativity and um, so I'd certainly say you know always contact your child's teacher or your SALT or OT because they can really help with um, making learning engaging and fun for the child um, also come to our next webinar next week on friday the 3rd of july um, at 10 30 because then we'll be focusing on engagement and amy will definitely be talking about some strategies that you can try at home as well um, if you want to email your child's class teacher it's just the name of their class and at manor.brent.sch.uk and then we also have the dedicated OT address if you want ideas for how to maybe make the activities more engaging or any equipment or strategies and resources that the OT team might be able to help with then that's ot at manor.brent.sch.uk hey. We've got hey. some questions coming in as well which is great so I'm just going to have a quick look here on the chat Okay, so one question is, my child will ask for things when I am sat with them playing, but if I am not directly with them, they will just sit there and wait for me. Uh, they will just sit there and wait for me to play with them, I think. Okay, so, so yeah. <laughs> So I think this, this is a difficulty where we've got two things going on. We've got communication and we've also got play skills. So we want our children to develop their uh, personal play skills, their individual play skills on, on their own. But we also want them to develop their kind of communication within play. So we can model with a, with a matched set of resources. So we could have half of the resources for ourselves and half for the child. Um, and we could so we can use that to show them what they can do with those things and then if the if the problem is that the child isn't um communicating within play then we can make sure that we're also modeling that so it sounds a bit like the problem is that um in that case that the child isn't willing to move to make that communication so if they're right there with you then they'll communicate but if not they'll just sit there or they they will just play on their own i hope i've understood that question correctly whoever's asked, asked that one um so so what we're looking at then is thinking about how do we encourage the child to travel to communicate so it's about really making sure that the motivation to communicate is there and then teaching them the skill that it's not just about communicating with people who are right there sometimes they might need to learn to go and get someone's attention sometimes they might need to um actually get up and take them a symbol or take them something that's not working there are loads of different situations where where that could happen so i think it's um it's really important to try and, and teach those skills and they are separate skills to just being able to ask for something when the circumstances mm -hmm. are perfect. So we might sometimes need a second person to help us teach a child how to do this. So it might be a case of noticing that they want something and instead of the main communication partner going in and showing them how to do something, we might have to then uh actually get someone else to guide them maybe gently stand up walk over maybe even to tap on the shoulder of that person or however they would normally communicate so that they start to realize that they can generalize the skill of however they would normally request to um requesting in this new situation which means moving away from the thing that you want to go and get someone's attention or get their help or ask them for something i hope that answered your question please chat again if it doesn't um, okay 
Okay, so we've had another question here. This is a this is a good one. We have lots of um, lots of parents ask this question. So sometimes we see that um, a child's receptive communication, so their understanding, is in advance of their expressive communication, and this is actually completely natural. That's completely the way that communication typically develops. So um, we normally see that children do understand more words than they can express themselves. Um, and and that's, that's the same in, in children who are typically developing. Um, and often children who have communication difficulties will still follow that pattern. Um, there may be some exceptions to that. So that's actually totally natural in that the children need to have some uh, understanding. They might not have that really pure understanding of the vocabulary completely that they would be able to understand it out of all context, but they have some kind of experience or knowledge of that concept or that word before they can then express it for themselves. And as I said before, there's often that case that receptive communication sort of looks a bit higher than it really is as well. So when we do our formal speech and language therapy assessments, we would strip out all of the support that we normally give, take out all of the contextual support, and we're really looking at that pure understanding of it, is the vocabulary understanding really there? And as I said, in lots of situations, children get really, really used to um, just following what someone else is doing, knowing what to do in that situation, just because the context is there. Um, sometimes there isn't much choice about what to do um, in a situation. So I think that's, um, it's, it's really important to, to remember that in some situations, the receptive communication might not be quite as high as it looks, but it is also totally natural for the uh, expressive to communication to be developing a bit behind that. I mean, uh, if you think about it in terms of yourself as well, like um, there are definitely words which I can understand when I, for instance, when I read them or hear someone else using them in context, maybe they're not in my vocabulary, so I wouldn't necessarily know how to use them or I might not feel confident to use them um, but I can understand if if someone else says it or if I read it in context I can sort of figure out what it means um, mm -hmm. so often we, we do have bigger receptive vocabularies than the expressive vocabulary that we use and that's the same when our vocabulary is developing as well okay we might have time for one more Okay, so um, one parent asked, um, my child uses one word or one word at a time, so like single words, but they can say more and I want them to use sentences. So this is similar to what we were talking about before, about the child who's just started to communicate. Um, the way to do that is really thinking about modeling longer sentences, so adding more so that the child knows how words can be joined together. Um, it's also important to think about what kinds of words they already know. So if they only know the names of lots of things, if they know lots of nouns, then it's going to be really hard for them to start making sentences because they might need some verbs in there as well and some other like adjectives and prepositions so um, that's one of the reasons why it's really important to think as we're teaching language make sure that we're teaching lots of different uh, lots of different types of uh, words because then when children begin to put things together there'll be phrases that work grammatically so it might be a really short phrase like um, dog eating but it's got a noun and a verb and if the child doesn't know any verbs it's going to be much harder for them to build sentences and there are some strategies that that we use to support with this modeling is the key one really in terms of um showing children in in very natural communicative circumstances how they could say more but it's also really important to think about um if there are times when they need to kind of learn in a structured way how to do that um, sometimes we use a, a resource called Colourful Semantics as a visual prompt and that can be really good because the colours coincide with the different um, types of words. Um, so we might have symbols that have coloured borders around them and then we teach initially teaching quite a structured phrase how to describe what's happening in an event or a video or a picture um, and it's 
really helpful for the child to see what kinds of words are missing in those sentences so then they they learn to select the right one and then eventually the symbols or the text can be taken away and the colors can be left as a prompt so that they start to understand how to sort of make that that progress in grammar and start putting their their words together um, but also thinking about you know in those really really motivating functional situations can you encourage your child through differential reinforcement for example to add another word onto their request that's another way of building it up so that they say um they say whole whole or longer phrases um because they've learned that that's that's a way to access more of what they want um okay um i'll just quickly have a chat about this one i might not be able to we might have time to answer this one too fully so if you're the person who's asked this feel free to email the salt address salt at manor.brint.sch.uk if you want some more help with this but the question is one that might ap apply to lots as well so um does my child repeats the same sentence many many times how do i reduce this repetition so often we see that um children engage in this kind of repetitive language where it's a form of self-stimulatory behavior so it could be that um, that the child is getting some kind of um, intrinsic reinforcement from saying that sentence over and over again um, it can also be a sort of uh, almost like a reassurance thing where if someone says a certain thing they know how that person is going to respond and often children who I don't know the child in this case. I don't. I don't know who I'm talking to. So I don't know if the child has autism. But if they do, um, then they okay. So they might be. Um, they might be feeling that kind of anxiety and wanting to be able to control the communicative situation in some way. So asking the same thing. Um, uh, or saying the same thing will often get the same response, and that can be that can be quite reassuring for the child. But obviously, it can be quite frustrating for us as communication partners because it feels like we're just hearing the same thing over and over again. And it could also be um, a case of echolalia. Um, so this is where children repeat um, words or phrases that they've heard. They might repeat them straight away. So if you ask them a question and they don't understand, they might just repeat the end of the question back to you. Um, but it can also be in a delayed form where they might repeat things that they've heard or kind of script through things that they've heard in in apps or TV or they've heard other people saying or parts of songs um, and again it is a, a case of providing them with the alternatives that they could use instead so you might take part of what they've said and show them how they could vary it uh, or you might try to um, if this isn't too difficult you might try to draw their attention away to something else so that they're really exposed to uh, a lot of language that they could say um, if it's happening in t in terms of a request um, we again we might uh, we might try to stop that so if a child comes up and just says apple 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 and you want them to just say apple we might stop reinforcing requests that come to us as apple 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 um, and just model apple and then reinforce when the when the child just does that so we can use that differential reinforcement technique um, again as well <laughs> thank you ellie for all your I great that was helpful <laughs> and thank you everyone for joining us today i hope you found it useful um, please join us again next week next friday for our engagement um webinar and um please send any other questions you thought about um and hopefully next week we can uh, join again and have a great meeting bye everyone thanks for coming everyone